Due to population growth and global warming, food security and food politics are becoming increasingly important. The World Food Summit of 1996 defined food security as when all people, at all times, have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe, and nutritious food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. Since food preferences are considered an aspect of food security, it is important to understand the dietary practices of the 55% of the population that are members of the Abrahamic faiths. In this video, we hope to answer the question, what is the significance of fasting and dietary restrictions in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam? Because this can provide necessary background information for a discussion of food insecurity and global food politics. Judaism is a religion that is often noted for its many laws that it abides by. One of those rules that is an essential aspect of practicing Judaism is the concept of keeping kosher, which means ritually fit. The precise rules for what is regarded as kosher is outlined in the Torah within Leviticus chapter 11 and Deuteronomy chapter 14. Leviticus chapter 11 declares, From among all the land animals, these are the creatures that you may eat. Any animal that has divided hooves and is cleft footed and chews the cud so that you may eat. But among those that chew the cud or have divided hooves, you shall not eat the following. The sacred text then goes through a long list of items that Jewish people may not consume, such as the hare and the pig. However, animals such as cows, sheep, goats, and buffaloes may be consumed. In regards to seafood, Leviticus states, These you may eat all of that are in the waters. Everything in the waters that has fins and scales, whether in the seas or in the streams, such you may eat. Everything in the waters that does not have fins and scales is detestable to you. Therefore, seafood such as shellfish are not permitted for consumption under kosher laws since they do not have fins and scales, but fish such as snapper and cod can be eaten. In addition, Leviticus also proclaims that Jewish people may not eat birds of prey such as the vulture, the eagle, and the raven. However, under kosher laws, chickens, ducks, turkeys, and geese are all examples of some birds that Jewish people may consume. Any flying insects that are non-hopping, such as flies, wasps, and bees, are not considered kosher. Neither are animals that move in the ground, such as snakes and lizards. Typically, all vegetables and fruits are considered kosher under Jewish law. For a meal to be considered kosher, meat and meat products may not be prepared, served, or eaten with milk products or milk derivatives. Due to this rule, utensils and dishes that are used for meat products may not also be used for milk products. One is also required to wait a specific period of time between one's consumption of meat and milk products. This specific kosher law is taken from Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 21, which states, You shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. Animals that are regarded as kosher may not have died from any kind of serious disease, especially within the lungs. A person must kill the animal. Deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 21 states, You should not eat anything that dies of itself. Secondly, the killed animals have to be drained of blood since Genesis chapter 9 verse 4 proclaims, Only you shall not eat flesh with its life, that is its blood. Blood is not allowed to be consumed due to the fact that blood is considered a sign of life. To ensure that blood is removed correctly from the animal, a shahit, a Jewish law trained religious butcher, slaughters the animal in a specific way. The meat typically also undergoes malika, a process of soaking and salting the meat to ensure the removal of any blood prior to consumption. During specific holidays, Judaism requires a certain fasting ritual in which typically adults have to live without food or water. These fasting rituals typically last from sunset to sunset. Jewish dietary restrictions are different during the celebration of Passover, where the foods in the cedar plate, in this case bitter herbs, a hard-boiled egg, and a lamb shake are all symbolic. Christianity as a religion was created from Judaism, and thus first inherited many of its practices relating to food. Over time, many of these fell away due to new rules in the church. One instance that led to the changing of the rules that they inherited from Judaism was when St. Peter received a vision of many animals that were previously disallowed by the church, and a voice telling him, Get up, Peter. Kill and eat. This led to the change in Christian law 
that allowed many animals to be eaten that were previously disallowed by Jewish faith. Due to the expansive nature of Christianity as a religion in modern times, it's become increasingly difficult to pin down a universal set of rules for the religion as a whole. Many different sects have adopted their own unique rules over time as to what is prohibited and what practices people should have around food. One sect of Christianity that has some specificity in its practices is Roman Catholicism. As this sect has a clear leader and a universal set of rules, it is easier to define the practices than some of the other traditions. In this faith, many of the rules center around major holidays. Holidays such as Good Friday and Ash Wednesday require the followers that are over the age of 18 to fast during these days. There is also no meat allowed on either of these two days for members over the age of 14. Every Friday of the year, eating meat is not allowed by canon law, although many practicing Catholics don't follow this rule. Regular fasting is also encouraged by the church, as a display of one's faith. While the majority of the other Christian sects do not have a strict guideline pertaining to dietary restrictions, there are a few exceptions. An example of this is the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, or the Tewahido Church. This church denomination believes that, besides its basis as a function of delivering sustenance to humans, food serves as a way of showing the relationship between humans and God. In this order, they have set up a calendar that gives a detailed outline of the expected fasting periods. For the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, fasting means solely refraining from eating red meat. The fasting is divided into seven sessions called Jina, Advent, Gehad, Epiphany, Nenewe, Hudade, which is Lent, Tsome, Hawariyat, the fasting of the apostles, Filseta, the fasting of the Assumption of the Holy Virgin, and required fasting on all Wednesdays and Fridays, with certain exceptions. In total, these fasting periods result in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church refraining from eating red meat on over 190 days a year. Like much of Christianity, there is little unity between the sects in regard to dietary restrictions. Also, as time has passed, fewer people are following the strict outlines of what they should or should not eat in their respective sect. This, combined with the fact that many sects, such as Protestantism, don't particularly have a set of rules regarding food, makes their traditions difficult to really give a code in regards to food. Christianity generally has never been strictly law-based as Judaism, and more and more people are now taking a more lenient approach to the guidelines of their respective sect. Islam is a religion of orthopraxy or right action. According to Greenstein, Islam is a total way of life, and every area of human existence comes under the authority of Islam. Unsurprisingly, there are many Islamic laws and teachings concerning food. These laws come from the Quran, Hadiths, and scholarly interpretations. The three major aspects of Islamic food laws are halal, fasting, and animal sacrifice. In the Quran, Surah 6, verse 145, Allah provides a list of foods that are haram, or prohibited. Prophet, say, in all that has been revealed to me, I find nothing forbidden for people to eat, except for carrion, flowing blood, pig's meat, it is loathsome, or a sinful offering over which any name other than God's has been invoked. But if someone is forced by hunger, rather than desire or excess, then your Lord is most forgiving and most merciful. Foods that are not prohibited are halal or lawful. The three main principles surrounding halal are 1. God alone has the authority to decide what is halal and haram. 2. Foods are haram because they are impure or harmful. 3. The only exception is necessity. People don't have to follow the rules if they are in desperate need, but it's up to the individual to determine if they are truly in need, and necessity doesn't exist if the society has surplus food. Muslims are neither allowed to eat haram foods, nor permitted to feed them to others, even if they are non-Muslim. Fasting is one of the five pillars of Islam. During Ramadan, the ninth month of the year, Muslims are required to fast from dawn to dusk. 
This comes directly from the Quran, Surah 2, verse 183 to 185. You who believe, fasting is prescribed for you so that you may be mindful of God. Fast for a specific number of days, but if one of you is ill or on a journey, then on other days later. For those who can fast only with extreme difficulty, there is a way to compensate. Feed a needy person. It was in the month of Ramadan that the Quran was revealed, so any one of you who sees in that month should fast, and anyone who is ill or on a journey should make up for the lost day by fasting on other days later. God wants ease for you, not hardship. He wants you to complete the prescribed period and to glorify him for having guided you so that you may be thankful. Ramadan ends with Eid al-Fitr, or the Feast of Fast Breaking. Muslims are required to donate food to the poor so that everyone can celebrate. To non-Muslims, fasting during Ramadan can seem extreme, but fasting is done to promote physical and spiritual empathy and solidarity between the rich and the poor, since those with food security have to endure the hardships of food insecurity. Fasting frees up resources to share with those in need, Feeding the hungry is also a form of atonement for sins. In addition to compulsory fasting during Ramadan, voluntary fasting is encouraged throughout the year. During Eid al-Adha, the Feast of the Sacrifice, Muslims are encouraged to share with the poor. Eid al -Adha commemorates Ibrahim's obedience to God and his willingness to sacrifice his son. Sheep are sacrificed on Eid al -Adha because of the sheep Allah provided to Ibrahim in place of his son. Families that can afford to sacrifice a sheep are to keep one-third for themselves, share one-third with friends and relatives, and give the last third to the poor as a reminder of their connection to the broader Muslim community. In the Quran, livestock and food more generally is seen as a way of glorifying God and being in community with others. Quran Surah 22 verse 34 to 35 says, We appointed acts of devotion for every community, for them to celebrate God's name over the livestock he provided for them. Prophet, give good news to the humble who give to others out of our provision to them. Islam is also highly concerned with promoting food security. In addition to rules concerning food distribution and charity, Islam prohibits food waste and overindulgence, encourages sellers to keep food affordable, and advises people to eat slowly and mindfully and communally. Although the specific dietary rules and practices are different for the three Abrahamic faiths, they all emphasize concern for those in need, generosity, and gratitude with regards to food. Now that we have looked at the dietary practices of Judaism, and Christianity, and Islam, we would like to take a moment to raise questions about the implications of these practices in the context of global food politics. Who controls food supply chains, and how can religious believers be sure that kosher and halal food labels are accurate? What should believers do when animal sacrifice is outlawed or not possible where they live? How should the three Abrahamic faiths address the challenges that arise when people do not have access to proper foods or unable to fast because they are food insecure, live in a kosher or halal food desert, or are incarcerated. These questions continue to be debated, but all three religions agree on the importance of having these discussions in order to address the widespread problem of food insecurity.